remember to turn that back on. It's all good. We are now recording. Mm-hmm. Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to you. And here we are, January 1, 2019. And that what better way to ring it in with than with all of you. Exactly. Happy New Year and welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Sandy Mellon. And... Um, you are visiting with us in the basement of our home here outside of the city of Grand Prairie. And um, yeah, it's been a great year. We thought we'd maybe just kind of bring you up to speed about what we've been doing, some of the some of the stuff that we've launched this year and maybe some of the things that we're going to do this year now. Well, it's been a day or two since you and I sat down to do a podcast. It was like... Mm, Remembrance, Remembrance Day yeah. or Memorial Day yeah. in the and, US. and I look back like it was... Uh, we just really actually got home, um, and uh, I was looking back to taking care of email and that this morning. It's like, it's like the middle of December that we've been on the run since, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been very busy. We were, um, we had an in-store with one of our, our TV sponsors in Edmonton, and I had board meetings for the Alberta Conservation Association. We had and trapping, trapping, trapping. Well, trapping. then we went and visited with our oldest son and his family. Um, in central Alberta, hoping that they were going to move into their house then, but they are moving in today. So that's been New Year's Day fun for, for them. them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Whole new year. <laughs> yeah, it's been busy. And, um, and one of the things that we did in 2018 was launch this podcast. And that was um, in January, or yeah. sorry, January. July. July. <laughs> July 2018. And uh, we launched it just before we left for Escanaba, Michigan, to attend the National Traffic Convention there this past summer. So yeah, well, and you I, were you were watching you were I watching was all watching the numbers the numbers roll up as we yeah. drove across the uh, drove from Grand Prairie, Alberta to Escanaba, Michigan. That's thirty hours one way one way. Yeah, and so it's lots of time to talk to one another, listen to podcasts, and and check for uh, check on on our, our numbers. Then I couldn't believe watching the numbers roll up the, the number of minutes downloaded in that. This is one of the things that I think is really cool because one of the big pushbacks we always get is that trapping. Well, it's kind of one of those, should be one of those little dirty little secrets or, or whatever, right? Well, people don't understand the relevance of something as ancient as trapping in today's modern world. They don't. And we'll get to that relevance here, here in a minute. But I want to talk about the acceptance of it. There's a lot of people, you know... <laughs> We I think talk. maybe they were ambivalent about it before, you know, well, not well, really not accepting, but I think that we give, knowing. I think we give far too much credit to the loud voices that are against us oh, than, yeah. than we do for the, the quiet ones that are with us. But that's really evident in a lot of things in society today, right? Absolutely true. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and when I take a look now, our, our YouTube site has been up uh, June of 2015 is when we started. And then it was really flat to begin with because I just didn't have much up and, and you, we, once you produce this, you know, you have a product there that... Uh, a body of work. Yeah, a body of work. And, and you know, you, you try to, you know, it's been aired on TV and that, you, then you want to try and make some money off it somehow. You know, I mean, it's 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 a valuable asset, but there was just nothing. And eventually we went to YouTube and, and so it got more and more. We recently monetized it. Now, yeah. we have had people ask us about monetization of it. Let me tell you for the dollar ninety four a month that we get for monetization that it's not <laughs> worth it for us, but... What it does is like with everything on the internet, is if you play the game by their rules, they they put you in the good algorithm. So, so let's be clear: there is only <laughs> one way to play, and that is by their rules. That's so, right. Yeah. So we're we're in the better algorithm, and and since we monetized, we've watched our subscription and our and our numbers go like this. And I mean, and like I say, it's a dollar ninety four a month. It's it's nothing, but. It has really helped spread the word, and that's what this is all about. If we're going to be yeah. donating our our, uh, our TV programs and that kind of stuff, you know, we, we, we might as well. I'm sorry if you, if you have to put up with an ad, but you, you can click them and get out of them. <laughs> well, it's really relevant, I think, just so that people understand that there is relevance to trapping, that it isn't just a bunch of hillbillies out, no. out in the woods and, and creating mayhem and not doing anything for any particular reason other than just killing animals. No, because when you take a look at those numbers now uh, on YouTube... We have had, get this, it's over 11 million minutes streamed, uh, which is 21 years, 21 years, folks, of, of content downloaded, streamed. Uh, we've been on uh, Amazon Prime now, 
uh, for 32, 32 weeks. 32 weeks. We're, yeah. we're over 3 million minutes streamed there. There's a lot of people that care about trapping. There's a lot of people that want to watch trapping. I think I think we've got a, a great message, and, and we're seems to be in this digital age that we're at the perfect time yeah. to be and talking no, and, about it. And the other part of that is is that not everyone is a trapper. They may know someone who traps. They may have had a connection in their past with a, a with a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle. Um, they may have learned about it in school. We did. Yeah, it, well, it was just part of the thing. But I mean, we learned a lot of things in school. Yeah, I, I packed my gun and and to school and put it in the uh, <laughs> put it in my locker and, and went. SWAT went. team would be called today if you did something. Well, I like went that. hunting with the shop teacher. Yeah, the, the industrial arts uh, teacher. We went. We go hunting after after school. I mean, the world has changed so much. But yeah, uh, the the message is there, and there's people that are still interested in it. So. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're hitting all these big numbers in YouTube. We're hitting these big numbers on Amazon. Uh, the podcast is, is doing really, really good numbers. Uh, it, it seems like it's a great time to be getting all of this information out there. Yeah, I think so. I think now there there seems to be more in the news, too, about just the interaction between wildlife and civilization, particularly in the urban centers. So there's been quite a bit in the news recently about, about Calgary, for one. Yep. And um, and then some of the major cities in the U.S. that have had issues with coyotes. And now coyotes being brazen enough to attack children where where it was pets up until now, which well, is bad enough. There's a lot of pets get ate by coyotes every year. And, and now, uh, as you say, that we, we're both Canada and the United States is seeing a drastic rise in the number of coyotes uh, attacks on humans. And I mean, if you're a coyote, we're a better place to be than, than, than in the city of Calgary. You know, it's a city of a million and a half or whatever. There's nobody there going to, nobody shooting at them or nothing else. Yeah. A friend of mine does the uh, animal damage control trapping in that for the city of Grand Prairie. And the city of Grand Prairie we live outside of is 70,000 70, 70, people, people, people live there. Yeah. He took uh, 25 or 26 coyotes last year um, in the back alley at Tony Roma's. You know, Tony Roma's the steak and rib place. I don't think it's got anything to do with Tony Roma's, but but that's that's in downtown Grand Prairie. Yeah. And he, he, he foothold. I mean, he, he has to foothold them because that way if you catch somebody's dog, you can release it and that kind yeah. of stuff. But but that, he does that, and he has to do it very much on the on the stealth. On the QT. On the QT. But, yeah, the, yeah he removes, uh, you know, problem beaver and problem uh, coyotes out, out of the city. So what better place? And it, it is... The funny part about all that is that the, it's the city people who have totally, they neither, neither either been, never been connected to the wild and, 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 uh, and the animals of the wild, or they forgot all about it because they're the ones that are voting to stop all of things like grizzly bear hunts. And yeah. We just. Well, it's an urban population that has no connection to wildlife other than perhaps Disney, which, you know, uh, God love Disney, but not not the portrayal of wildlife in, in Disney. Oh, we just had a, a terrible thing happen in the Yukon. And it's funny because it's, uh, it's in Jim Shockey's uh, backyard. Well, it's in his hunting concession. And he thinks that he probably had an interaction with this grizzly bear the, this past fall. And he knows or is pretty sure that it's the same grizzly bear that they've they had a, on the TV program where they actually, they shot at it and, and did everything to scare it away multiple yeah. times. Yeah. This bear, anyway, went into a trapper's cabin and killed the trapper's wife. And their 10-month-old baby girl. Yes. The trapper didn't know any of this had happened, and he runs into the bear on his way back to the cabin. The bear is very aggressive, and he finally ends up killing the bear. Uh, and then he finds his family. And then he finds his family. But you know the part that angers me? It just me? gives you shivers. The part that angers me the most is that if he had not, if his family was okay and all that, how much trouble would he been in? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's all because of people who don't understand what it's like to interact with wildlife and, and. And now there are there is more aggressiveness on the on on the part of hunters and trappers to try and change that narrative to to be more truthful than than what governments would have you believe in terms of the numbers of grizzly bears and um, and the like, right? Because in B 
BC in British Columbia, the province of British Columbia, which is our neighboring province to the west, they shut down grizzly bear hunting yep. about a year ago. Yep. And there is now a lawsuit pending. In fact, I think there's more than one. One is from an outfitter. Yeah, and it's actually, uh, I think, going to be, uh, it's hosted by by the Outfitting Association. A- am I correct in thinking that? I don't know the specifics about it, but but it's ruined his livelihood. Yeah. Right? And uh, the same thing has happened in Alberta, where the Alberta government has bowed to pressure from um, uh, PETA-like groups, maybe not PETA themselves, but PETA-like groups of of folks who who say that there's no grizzly bears are an endangered species and and now there have been there have been multiple 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 encounters with grizzly bears and and that's the thing you have to understand about a grizzly bear is that they have their own particular territory but i mean geez you can go to the mountains now and you can you can see a lot of bears it's actually uncomfortable now i yeah. mean the the, the uh... and maybe that was the whole idea well, the grizzly the grizzly numbers are getting so high, especially in the foothills and the mountains areas that, like, say, where we we, we hunt bighorn sheep and that. Mm-hmm. It's uncomfortable. You might see ten bear in a day. I mean, yeah. that's crazy, and they have no fear of you whatsoever. No. And I'm I'm not. It's not like grizzlies ever had a lot of fear of people, but we kept their numbers in check. Yeah. You know, and now now there are people that have full time jobs, um, scaring bears away from from oil camps, you know, yeah. or logging camps where, because where men are working. it's illegal to kill them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's Ill- illegal to kill them. And I mean, it's, just, it's, it's just crazy the situation we've ended up in. And I know biologists who work for the government who will not let their name be uttered, but have said that we have enough grizzly in Alberta for, for a, a hunt. Mm-hmm. BC has 15, over 15,000 is their population. Average year, they kill less than 250. When they were hunting for them, they killed less than 250. The whole basis of this lawsuit is that it, is that the whole idea behind what we brought about uh, hunting laws, regulations, uh, seasons, and all that for was to manage game. Yeah. It was to scientifically manage game for the future. Well, the... The science of it is completely out the window now. The socialist government, the New, New Democrat government in uh, BC... Has, and Alberta. Uh, well, but in BC, they've 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 said right out right, it's got absolutely nothing to do with science. It's just we don't have those values anymore where there should be trophy hunters. And where did the word trophy become a bad word? Yeah. Well, I think it it just it it is supposed to denounce anyone that that hunts for sport or you know takes a picture of anything. I mean, anything can be a trophy. Right, depends on what your mind is, I guess. But they, but it denotes a negative connotation now, and it's you. You wonder why, but it's it's kind of the same thing as dirty oil. You know, it's oh yeah, we hear lots (laughs) of that. (laughs) I I think I think the big thing is is I mean, we've allowed this to happen, but like you say, now the pushback's starting to happen because. Once you've lost everything, this is what everybody has always always been so quiet about. Oh, we better be quiet because, uh, you know, they could take it all away. Well, they've taken it. Yeah. They've taken it and, and they're taking it. Well, we've so quietly now- allowed a lot of things to be taken away from us to the point where now people have, have as you say, lost everything yep. or are near to losing everything. And, and why not fight now? Well, you, you take with these these folks in, uh, it happened in Alberta, but it, it, it just happened so recently in BC. And uh, and uh, well, one of our friends, uh, he has, I, I believe he's allowed to take five or six grizzly a year. Well, those are, those are $10,000, $12,000 hunts. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of money every year. Yeah, it is. A lot. And it employs people and yeah. it puts money into communities. It You know, none of this happens in a vacuum. And we're probably preaching to the choir, but, you know... Anything that is done uh, from commerce is it benefits more than just the individual yeah. who yeah. accepts the the cost or the price of a grizzly bear hunt or a moose hunt or a wolf hunt or whatever. I I, I love the argument that um, well, if there's no no hunting, then people would come on camera safaris. No. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's an argument in, in, that a lot of people try to use for Africa is that people will come on 
on uh, camera safaris and it couldn't be further from the truth. And Just, when something has a value, it's protected and, um, you know. It's, well, it's as simple as this is, a, is that there's nothing stopping them from going. There's nothing stopping the two, the, the hunting safari and the photo safari from them, from them yeah. both functioning at the same time. There's nothing stopping that. No. So we already know that photo safari will be 20% of what hunting safaris are. It's yeah. a, 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 we already know that. Yeah. And so now if we get rid of this, this the, the, all of the, the money and income and, and employment and everything that goes with the hunting, now we're left with this little tiny bit uh, for the photo safari. And it's just not, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't pay. Um, one of the other things that's happened really recently in the news is the uh, river otter in, uh, was it Stanley Park in Vancouver, British Columbia. Actually, no, it ended up right downtown. They, they think it might have came from Stanley Park. Oh, okay. It's it's but, kind of funny because they, they actually have, um, <laughs> it's like CSI or something, folks, but they have a picture that they uh, got on a, um, uh, like a red light camera or something like that. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew what this was going across, uh, across <laughs> this busy highway. Cause it Why did you suspect it might be a river <laughs> otter? <laughs> well, no, it, it's it, it's right in, in downtown, and it ends up in the Japanese gardens. And the Japanese gardens have these uh, uh, these koi ponds. Ancient and koi. Some of them are 40, 50, 60 years old, yeah. these koi are. Well, guess what? <laughs> where the otter is? In heaven. <laughs> yeah. So this otter, um, they and they couldn't catch it. They could not catch it in a live trap. They, they did employ trappers to try and catch it, but... Uh, eventually what they ended up having to do was to scoop all the remaining koi out of the pond and move them to, I guess, to the aquarium at, um, at Stanley Park in the zoo to, to protect them until they could <laughs> either capture or until the, the otter left. I don't remember what happened with that. Do you? I know. I, I could have fixed their trouble in well, no time. Well, <laughs> I think there were a lot of trappers that know how to catch river otter that could have done a good service for them, but... You yeah. can't fix stupid, but man, yeah. that was so funny because they were, one side was whining and crying about these old fish getting ate and the other side was, well, how come the animals there? And, and here, and then, then, then you have this, this, well, we'd have called it a trail camera, but then it was a stoplight camera, I believe. And here's this otter going across, <laughs> across the, the An intersection, busy intersection. Yeah. It yeah. was funny, funny as could be, but there's another interaction that they, they, they don't know what to do with. It, that otter was doing what he was supposed to do. People were absolutely mortified that there he was eating these carp. They're just fish. Yeah. Like, honest to God, they're just fish, and that's what he's supposed to do. So, you know, and the, the, the nature of things is, is that, you know, some trapper should have went there and trapped him, and that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah. You know, you have to take care of those, those issues. Yeah. Well, we do have um, a lot of friends that do damage control um, trapping at, here in Alberta. And as you say, we have a friend close by who, who does a lot of it as well. And someone that I'm involved with from the board on the Alberta Conservation Association, that's a business for them. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people are contacting trapper associations for problem coyotes with cattle herds. And, uh, and actually, there's a, a bison farmer northwest of here who contacted me. Uh, as his banker, actually, because <laughs> he knew I was a trapper. Funny how that goes. <laughs> Looking for assistance with wolves because he had wolf predation in his bison herd. So, um, you know, it's just, it's uh, how our circle becomes ever closer, it seems. And a lot of it is because people are now not so worried about telling somebody if they're a trapper or not. Um, I, it's It's not a dirty secret. It's you know, we we are a group of good people who are concerned about conservation, preservation, wildlife in general, and and the relationships between the wild and the city dwellers. Well, you need that buffer, and then the, and then mm -hmm. it comes down to actually the to to the reality, the the uh, economic reality of it. And we can um, talk about live moving beaver all you want in your lifetime, but we know from from having trapped live trapped beaver and moving them you're moving them into another beaver's territory yeah i mean it, the, the fact of the matter is that in alberta and bc uh, here every place that's, that's viable has beaver in it and, and that's even, almost cruel 
to well, think about doing it that it way. It is too. because it, they don't know they don't know where their assets are as far in that area. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to compete against a beaver that does know the assets. The fighting fighting gets get, gets pretty gruesome, but you end up with the situation is that what do you do with these animals? Like people get upset that that, that you're going to kill them. Well, I take a look at uh, if the uh, rural management, you know, the RMA uh, phones me up and says, you know, we've got a beaver damming a road here, be- damming a culvert. Well, if they have to take and go take care of that themselves, it's 250 an hour for trucking. Yeah. You know. Uh, they- well, this is just, this is just to undam a culvert. Exactly. Right? It's not to deal with the beaver itself. No. No, yeah. so two two fifty an hour for to, for trucking minimum an hour to get the excavator there. They use the excavator. Usually they take a great big tree and they push it back through the culvert to pu- push out the dam and, and that. So two fifty an hour for that. Another two fifty an hour for for trucking. We're sitting at seven hundred fifty to a thousand dollars flat just for that. And the next morning the beaver will have it plugged again. Yeah, he'll he'll. They're he'll, an industrious little creature, oh, aren't they? <laughs> so you you start looking at the economic realities. Beaver aren't rare. No. There is nothing rare or endangered about beaver. There's nothing rare or endangered about any of the fur species. No. And that's the truth of it is that they have to be managed. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's Well, we know that and I'm I'm sure you all know that too. So it's um it's just something that is always mindful for us, I guess, as we as we go through our world as trappers and to share what we know about it and share the relevancy of continuing on a uh, an old tradition, one that opened Canada, opened the West, for sure. Yep. Yeah, no question. Yeah. So that's a that's a big part of what we've been doing is is interacting with a, a lot of folks um by way of Facebook and um always your feedback on YouTube and Amazon Prime. Any comments you care to share with us, we are very happy to receive them and we're grateful that you're watching. So thank you for that. We, uh, of course, have, have kept you up to, up to date uh, on our various chores around the cabin. Uh, this year coming up is going to see some major work. Yeah. I got half a roof oof, roof to a to roof, re- oof, oof. Yeah. <laughs> half a roof to replace. And He's the- only stuttering because it's a big job. <sighs> Well, after last year building a house for a son, it doesn't seem to be too bad. <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to do that. Get a new uh, wood stove. A the queen, new wood the queen stove. of fire burnt the old one out. Yeah. Well, it had had a few years of use before I got a hold of it. But um, <laughs> what's what's the old saying? It, it was old when Christ was a cowboy. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> Cabin's in good shape, and you know, I mean, regular maintenance though, as any homeowner or cabin owner would know. Regular maintenance is required, and um, so we got a new new wood stove to put in. Um, looking forward to that. Maybe won't burn as much wood. Probably not. No, it's yeah. it's quite efficient. Um, I mean, what we're b- burning isn't really high quality wood. I mean, it's pine. Yeah, well, and it's beetle killed pine. And for those of you that may not know what that is, it's a, there's a pine beetle that managed to cross the Rocky Mountains from BC into Alberta and is co- has caused quite a bit of devastation in the forest industry. And so what we cut down is standing dead, essentially. They're dead trees. They're not of any good uh, use to a logging company or anybody else. And so we cut them down and we split them. And this year has been really efficient because we had a new splitter to use and hey but i've got another one i know it's sitting out behind the garage right now you're gonna have to watch for this i'll, I'll be getting some youtube stuff up up on it uh, right away we uh like to burn um birch wood here at, in the house uh we have a nice fireplace upstairs and we burn a fair amount of wood there every yep. e- every year i don't know a couple cords anyway yeah two three cords and the thing about uh, getting wood isn't the work so much as the time. You know, if you go out, we go out and, and we can get a permit, we can cut uh, birch wood uh, in the, the forest around here. But it's easy day to get yourself a cord of wood. So it, by, by the time you're done, you're, you're, your day's shot and you get yourself a cord Easily. of wood. Easily. So, yeah. you know, you end up them three cords of wood or whatever, it's three days. I uh, contacted a guy in the uh, logging industry. They got to be good for something, huh? <laughs> Lord knows they cut down a lot of our trees on our trap line. Yeah. Anyway, one of the things that happens is they actually do salvage work on uh, 
um, birch. So when they have birch, they, they take and stockpile it in, in the yard at the, the sawmill and, and you can buy it. We bought an entire... Log load or yeah. a truck load. Truck load of logs. Yeah. Truck what t- was that? 32 tone? Tone. tone. So that's 2,200 pounds per tone. Yeah. You know. That's a lot of wood. <laughs> and it also is sitting out behind. Not all of it though, because uh, we made a little trade with a friend of ours who we bought some of his. He did the same thing last year. And we went on New Year's Day last year and cut a bunch of um, a bunch of wood out of his um, pile deck. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, deck of we've, we, we've got this. I don't know, thirty ton or whatever, still still out there, sixty thousand pounds anyway. And uh, so I went and seen the guys that I uh, seen Rich at uh, Range Road Enterprises, mm-hmm. and I got his his number one wood processor. So it. Is a unit that, that actually cuts it to length, it drops down, it splits it, and then it fires it out the back onto a, a conveyor and yep. it convey, conveys it out. And, it all, and it also on the other end, this is all, uh, you have a 9 or 11 or 15 horse motor. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not We haven't looked closely enough yet. Well, I was so busy. I mean, it was one of those things <laughs> I picked up on, on, on my way flying around here in, in the month of December. It's still sitting on the trailer out there. Uh, but it's also got a log lifter. Yeah. So that's really cool. With the with, with the lever, I, I, I take and uh, push lever. It lifts the logs. They roll over, and then it's got a feed. So it's got these these big pineapple rollers that the, that that feed it in, and, and away you go. So it's going to be pretty cool. I, yeah, I'm excited cool. to to uh, work on this. We'll get some uh, footage up on it, and just because it's fun, and not a not a lot of people think that pr- processing sixty thousand pounds of wood is fun, but I think it is. Well. <laughs> A lot of people aren't us, so no. and that'll be just something that we have out in the out in the back here. The, the that's the nice part about living where we live is that we have a lot of area for storage of that sort of thing and and just to mess around with it, right? Like when was that Oct- November that 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 wood was delivered, right? I don't know. It's all a blur right now. I know, I know. Yeah, and part of it was Richard alluded to this earlier that. Um, that our son and his wife were building a home in Red Deer. And uh, that meant that dad was doing a lot of the work. So I didn't see a lot of Richard from the 1st of May until probably the end of July. Well, no, middle of July, because that was about when we went um, down to Escanaba. Yeah, we've talked about this. Let's talk about what they really want to know. How's the trapping season going? What do they really want to know? Actually, we've had a good trapping season so far. Good year for Martin. Has been, has been, and until this last check. Yeah. And I didn't get one on the last check, which yeah. is which Got is unusual. a fisher, but not a Martin. But you know the really weird thing? I'm mm-hmm. getting refusals. So I, I I can't figure that out. Like well, a, a refusal is when, when they come up and they'll actually climb the tree, or it looks like they climbed the tree, or if you have a leaning log, that's worse. That's, that's really rubbing your nose in it. There's a <laughs> leaning log, it's got snow on it, and the tracks go up the log. And they and look, they look the, at it, yeah. and then they turn around and say, nah, don't think so. Some of it, but you had pointed out that maybe some of the of the actual bait that's in the box is kind of freeze-dried. Well, I've been really watching it, because this year we have just an, a terrible population of pygmy shrews. Yes. And pygmy shrews will, will oh, eat Oh, they're eat just frozen. little guys, yep. about that big. Yep. But they eat frozen meat, and they... they they will take and leave a skeleton there, just like a, like it was ready for the museum. There'd be no meat or anything on it, just just completely cleaned off. And so I watch for that because you know I use uh, like muskrats and that kind of stuff, and you throw them in there. And lots of times, if you just glance in there, you, there's a rack of bones, and you don't realize that, it, that there's no meat there. So I've been watching for that to to see that that situation hasn't happened. But I had one that that I had a turn turn away on, and I had still had a piece of meat in there like that, right? Mm. So I took and, and pulled it out, and it's like it weighed just about next to nothing. Yeah. So I took and cut it in, the, in half, you know, to thinking to you know open it up and maybe you know some more, some more uh, get, uh, odor in that, and it's like freeze dried right through. Yeah. So I think I, I'm going to have to take and rebate everything because we still got a month of uh, of Martin season left. Yeah, month of Martin season, and um, you know how many fishers do we have now? Seven. I don't know. I think seven. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Our quota is 18. Yep. And uh, many, many of the of the first years that we trapped on that particular, on our registered fur management area, 
trap line. Um, we we were at or one over our quota, which and and we had very few martin. Yeah. So now our martin population is coming back, and the fisher population has started to to fall. Do you know what's off the charts? Is our mink oh, and our yeah. ermine mink. Mink climbing a tree. I'm doing a, I'm doing a show on mink. We get lots and lots of requests about uh, about mink. Mm-hmm. But our our uh, system here, or how we get mink here, is so very different than anything that that uh, you folks uh, end up uh, doing because we'd have no running water. Well, our water is 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 under the ice right now, mm-hmm. uh, so we have to trap them a very different way. And it'll be it's going to be a cool show. But we have had a lot of mink taking climb four or five feet up a tree and, and get into the box, which is yeah. unusual. The uh, ermine, uh, the short tailed weasel that we have here. I, I was just out today putting up some more of them, and I think we're hitting, we're sitting at 40 or more of them already. For the- <laughs> pizza money. <laughs> <laughs> How many pizzas can Well, and actually, last year, you did pretty well. I did on my, on my um, XLs. My XLs went for over nine bucks each, and that was, that was awesome. Yeah. And we do have big weasels. Like, there aren't, like, there, it's called the least weasel. No. Nope. Right? No, nope. this is a short-tailed. Oh, okay. The least is a really small little guy. Oh. And it's the least biggest. It's the least <laughs> biggest. Okay, so the short tail weasel. Um, we don't trap them around the cabin because they do keep our mice yeah, and uh, squirrel population down, although squirrels are up. We've oh, got yeah. We've had a lot, of, a lot more squirrels around the cabin this year to the point where we've had to snare them around the cabin. Oh, I put them up, and I don't know what we'll do with them. Put them in the freezer for maybe one day they'll be worth something again. Who knows? Now. We'll have we'll have a bunch of them. And we'll have a stock yeah. pile. Anyway, I had it. we we laugh a lot about about pizza money because the first few years that we that we trapped, we were getting about six bucks a weasel, I think. Yep. And uh, at that time, you could buy a you bake pizza for eighteen bucks or something like that. So we just called it pizza money. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't a whole lot, but <laughs> it took three weasels to buy a pizza, sort of thing, and and that's just sort of been one of our little, ongoing jokes, a little inside joke. <laughs> I had a, I had a crazy thing happen though on uh, was it Christmas Day? Christmas Day? I was checking otter traps, mm. and otter traps are we either put them, you know, uh, we blind set along the trail or a place where they're accessing in and out of a hole. You'll you'll put put a trap over top of the hole. Well. On on what's called a a a spillover or whatever on a dam, the the water can, stays open as long as there's enough of a current going going over. The water stays open, and I like to take and set traps in there. But you got to have the water deep enough so that your trap, when it compresses, will hold the otter down so that it doesn't freeze to the underside of the ice. So we took and uh, and is he growling? No. Nope. Oh, <laughs> we t- we took and uh, set up on this on this one. Uh, uh, dam and t- took a set of a pair of traps there and the water's been running there and, and they've been there now for those traps have been there for three weeks and I go there and I religiously break it open and check and the otters haven't been back yeah you know sometimes they're back the next day and sometimes it's weeks before they're back mm-hmm. but the other day I was like one of them sprung right that was Christmas yeah. day I think it was and so I'm there and, oh yeah because I, I was I was late uh, getting in for supper and I was hungry and and I'd already told you to put the coffee on, and then all of a sudden I've got something in the trap, and it's under, <laughs> it's under the water. I think water. it was Christmas Eve, because Christmas Day we were we went elsewhere for dinner. Okay. Yeah. So I, I get it broke open on that, and I, and, and I start pulling it out. I was like, wow, this is big, and it's a 60-pound beaver. Well, yeah. 59 pounds. I still haven't got 59. a 59.2. It's really <laughs> weird. As many times as we set those that open water situation in the wintertime, you never get a beaver. I've never ever got a beaver on a on a spillover or yeah. or those open never. Yeah. You know, it, it it's so weird. And you'd think it would be natural for them to want to come out there and, and to try and stop the running water. Yeah. But they, it just it's like they For whatever reason they don't, but they did. This one did anyway. <laughs> Older should have been wiser, wasn't whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so we're we're sitting pretty good with the uh, the Martin. We've got a couple dozen of them. We've got the We've got five lynx. Six. Oh, six. One was half eaten. Yeah, the yeah. one was the one just became bait for other for uh other pens and that lots of kitties this year. Yeah. Which is really good because last year we had a lot of juvenile kitties. Yes. And they were very um cannibalistic. Cannibalistic, yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, mama and the kittens 
and mama would get caught and the kittens would eat her or the kittens would get caught and mama would eat them. It was, yeah, it's crazy, but that's, that's cats. They are very cannibalistic and you don't, don't die in a house if you own a cat. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, what's tomorrow night's fancy feast. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> cats are a very different thing, but but we have seen a lot, a lot of kitty sign this year Big because there's too. lots and lots of rabbits, yeah. and that in our in our country, that's the big thing is the population of rabbits will determine always oh, what's going snowshoe on. Snowshoe hares always always mm-hmm. determine the how the uh, population of the lynx always. But we've um, it, it's uh, pretty interesting uh, the fact that uh, we went from all those little cats last year. Mm-hmm. And now this year they're big. Yeah, you know, like I mean, uh, we had uh, we just did a uh, a guess the weight of the kitties on on our Facebook site. Yeah, and it was kind of funny because I had five cats hanging there, and everybody guessed the weight, and we we we, we just did, did a random draw to everybody that played along to to win a hoodie. Uh, the five of them weighed one hundred and eleven point four pounds together. Yeah, you know, there was uh, two over twenty six pounds. Yeah, those and they have feet that big. You know, like bigger than my, I, I can put yeah. them on the palm of my hand, and my, my palm disappears. Yeah, that's how big their feet are, right? Yeah, they are cool. Cats are so cool, um, and you can really tell a cat track in the snow. It's it's very distinctive. They're about as bright as this coffee cup, but <laughs> they're cool. <laughs> well, a friend of ours told us once that you know, I mean, you can you can kind of pattern what what the canine species are going to do, the coyotes and the wolves, and you can kind of pattern everything else as far as fur bearing animals goes but he said cats are kind of like hippies yeah. stone hippies wandering <laughs> through the woods they don't have any rhyme or reason as to how they want to do things but they just do it oh it happens like i i, I watched I, I actually followed one all the way in he he probably went for about half a mile he just got hit it was and i knew it's a male because hmm. now they're, they're starting to move because the their mating, their season. mating season's coming up and he Got on my trail and just kept moving. And, and, you know, he's headed straight for a pen. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to be there. But do you know how many times they get within like 50 yards or 50 feet or whatever of a pen and then they walk off that way? And you know that the wind's wrong, so they don't even know it's there. But this yeah. guy walked right into it. Or and... something else catches their attention, some shiny object somewhere or squirrel. whatever. <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are the ultimate squirrel for sure. But we were way behind getting everything set up. But over Christmas break, I got. I used 60 more snares. I ran out of snares, so I've still yeah. got a few more to set we up. We came home a day early because we ran out of snares. Well, we came, <laughs> yeah. It was kind of ha- handy, though, because we were kind of like the riders in the storm there. We were we were just ahead of it. We, yeah. We were, Big snowstorm that we got here just hours after we got home. So it was nice like the, that we got home in time. Front wheels were on pavement, dry pavement, and the, and the, the trailer was in the blizzard. Almost. <laughs> it was that close. Yeah. We, uh we were lucky to get home when we did, but it was good timing. Okay. Yeah. And still lots of lots of trapping season left, like Rich said. You know, the the um, Martin season goes till the end of January in our area and otter and lynx go so lynx goes till the middle of February yep. and otter is until middle of May. May yep. Although we don't trap them that late here. Um, but we don't have any otter yet this year, so that'll be nope. That'll be something to target when we go out again this weekend. And um, what else? What else is going on? Well, there's beaver and muskrat, but we haven't started. Oh, yeah. I haven't set up on any of them. There's a lot of muskrat uh, push-ups this year. There are more push-ups this year yeah. for many, many years, actually. Well, not many, many years. What if that's got anything to do with mink? Yeah, maybe. Why the mink numbers are up. It's really funny because everybody talks about how um, otter eat uh, baby beaver or otter eat... Uh, uh, muskrat and all that. I have a lot of. Uh, you're going to see on my uh, on our, the show this year on mink. Uh, I have a box full of of muskrat sitting on a on a beaver dam or on a beaver house because every mink and every otter, as they go through the watershed, that's where they go. Mm-hmm. They got to check out the dam. That's one of the places where they can get underwater, and they got to go check out the the house because lots of times they can get into the house. Yeah. What's really cool is that when you have a dam, so supposedly you know here's the beaver house and here's his dam. Is that on the far end of his dam? He'll have a bank beaver. Uh, he'll have a bank uh, den. Yeah. And lots of times the otter will take and, and dig into it from the outside, and that way they get underneath. Uh, they get. A, they're always looking to get back underneath yeah, the, the water. Of course. But that's why you can take and set a trap out in front of that dam, set it sideways, and you'll catch him going back and forth to the. Yeah. You know, to to his 
I don't know, man cave or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Anyway, so we got a lot more of that coming up. You you just moved the wolf bait, so we're hoping that we might run yeah. into some wolves. We don't have very many wolves on our line. I think we've talked about that before, but occasionally there's a there is a pack or two that travels through. We don't have a lot of big game um, no. out there, but there's a horse running around out there. So who knows? Might be wolf bait. Yeah, I know the I know the fellow from. Uh, the settlement that says that uh, it's his horse, but he hasn't come and got it. Well, he can't seem to catch it, so. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, the wolves come back through it. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. It's a single mare. She ain't going to have much chance. Yeah. No. But And the snow's getting deeper. They, you know, up at the, up at the cabin, we got a lot more snow again, just like we did here at home. Yeah. So got six to eight here, inches so. or well, something We've got, a, like got that. a foot up there. And, oh. And here we got, yeah. I don't know. We got a couple storms of six, seven inches, but anyway, <laughs> shall we wrap it up? We should wrap it up, but we should wrap it up by saying how grateful we are that you continue to tune in to the Scuttlebutt as well as the Facebook pages and Amazon Prime and YouTube, and we do appreciate all that you do to spread the word, spread the truth about trapping, and direct people to come and visit with us. They can find everything right from www.trappinginc.com. And we're still working on the video journal. <laughs> yeah, we are still working on the video journal. That, among other things, it's been busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, take care. Maybe we'll see you out in the line.